What I'm going to talk about is palliative care as being integral part of cancer care. And so I'm going to also distinguish between uh, palliative care and hospice care because uh, there are parts of them that are similar and parts that are different. So the questions that I'm going to answer or try to answer in the time that I have is what is palliative care? Why is it needed? Where does it fit in respect to overall cancer care? And are palliative care and hospice care the same? A broad definition of palliative care, I think, is really important. It's both a philosophy of care, so it's a way that we approach care and an organized, highly structured system for delivering palliative care to people with life-threatening or debilitating illnesses. So right there in that very first part of the definition, you see that it's not only end-of-life care, it's much further back in the disease trajectory. Uh, palliative care is patient and family-centered care, so again, it focuses on the patient and family as being the unit of care. When someone has cancer, it's not just the patient's uh, situation, it's the whole family situation also. The family, as well as the patient, is affected by cancer. It focuses on effective management of pain and other distressing symptoms, and also incorporates the psychosocial and spiritual um, aspects of a person's care and of the patient and family needs and focuses on the individual's values, beliefs, and culture. So all of that is the way the philosophy of palliative care and how we approach the care we give to patients and their families. The goal of palliative care, then, is to prevent and relieve suffering and to support the best quality of life for patients and their families, regardless of the stage of the disease so it's based very much on the needs of the patient and family, and it's not tied in to closeness to death. And that's very important, and that's one of the distinctions uh, with hospice. Palliative care, then, uh, is thought of as part of comprehensive cancer care. It can be delivered at the same time as life-prolonging therapies, or when those life prolonging therapies are no longer helpful to the patient and may indeed be causing more distress and decreased quality of life, then that becomes a main focus of care. So that would be the end-stage care. And it also helps uh, working with distressed patients and families, particularly when they're in transitions or changes in goals of care, from cure to life prolongation. And when life prolongation is no longer possible, to end-of-life care and trying to bring this end of your life into the, your whole uh, story of your life so it's not just isolated from the rest of your life. So those transitions when they're different goals of care can be very distressing for patient and family and so we can help walk you through that and support you at that time. This then is a model of uh, uh, palliative care which can be quite useful. So curative or uh, life-prolonging therapy, uh, if you have pain, shortness of breath, distress, other symptoms, palliative care goes along the life-prolonging or curative therapy. But if that becomes no longer helpful and indeed is causing you more distress without benefit, so the burden outweighs the benefit, then palliative care becomes a focus of care. And then at the end of life, when that person comes to the end of their life and indeed uh, dies, then palliative care continues into the bereavement follow-up for the families. So it's very palliative care is very comprehensive care. And at this end of life, when there's a life expectancy of six months or, or less, when palliative care is the focus of care, the model of care where palliative care is practiced is a hospice model of care. So all the way through is palliative care, but the model that palliative care is intensified at end of life is a hospice model of care. Uh, very specifically then, uh, palliative care, this family-centered approach, addresses physical symptoms, pain, for example, shortness of breath, nausea, 
difficulty in sleeping, uh, difficulty in eating, poor appetite. Those are all the, the aspects of those physical symptoms that palliative care addresses. But it also addresses the non-physical causes of suffering, emotional, spiritual, and social. And as I go through some of these, these symptoms that, that a palliative care team addresses, you can see why you need a multidisciplinary team to approach these different aspects of the person and family's needs. So all the time, we're trying to look at the whole patient and family within their, their network and with their social framework. Um, it can also be this focus uh, uh, on helping the patient and family sort out um, who they are now, uh, particularly in a setting where they, their body isn't functioning as it did before, and they may not sort of recognize their role in the world because they feel so different from the way they were before. And then very much the healing that's not physical, for example, the relationship with self and God and with others, again, depending on the individual. So the focus very much on palliative care um, is, uh, and also hospice care is really a quality of life model. Physical well-being, psychological well-being, social well-being, and spiritual well-being. And looking at that a little more closely, uh, physical could be things like functional ability, fatigue, um, sleep and rest, nausea, appetite, uh, constipation, and very importantly, pain. Pain is such an important issue in palliative care and also in end-of-life care that Dr. Galeri is going to address that symptom specifically. And then psychological anxiety, depression, um, pain, distress, the distress associated with pain, um, fear, and sometimes um, not able to concentrate because you're so nervous. And then the social and also the spiritual aspects of quality of life. Those are all aspects that a palliative care dream will address depending on the needs of that particular patient and that particular family. So it's very much individualized care. You can see then why um, uh, palliative care is an integral part of comprehensive cancer care. It's not separate from, it's part of. Um, these symptoms, physical, emotional, and spiritual, can occur at any stage of the disease but they tend to become more severe as someone has advanced disease, but they can also be early on in the disease process. And because palliative care is an integral part of cancer care, we work alongside the oncologists um, and other members of the healthcare team, so we integrate with them. What you can see then, in a way, when you're looking at palliative care, it's a partnership between experts. In relation to the disease process and symptom control, the clinicians are usually the experts. In relation to the impact of the illness, the patient and the family are the experts. They know their own goals, their values, their beliefs, their cultures. So what, in a palliative care team, we shift the focus from being the person with cancer, but being the person who has cancer. So we focus on the person and what that person needs, the quality of life for that person within their family. What's the relationship then of oncologists to palliative care? And frequently, um, oncologists themselves will uh, provide or access the needed care for patients and their families from the resources within an institution. So they may call in a pain expert. They may call in someone from integrative medicine for um, massage, uh, relaxation, imagery. Uh, they may call in a social worker. And this care then is integrated with the general oncology care. So we may, the palliative care team may not get called at all. But usually the palliative care team is called in um, when people have more complex needs, multiple needs, difficult to control pain or other symptoms. Um, help in working with the patient and family with advanced directives if they're having difficulty in sorting that out, and very much helping uh, with transitions and goals of care and site of care. It can be very difficult when someone's been followed at an institution like this for a long period of time, and the focus of care now switches to end-of-life care, 
And so there's a transition from the site of care to Memorial Sloan Kettering into a hospice, home hospice program. And that can be very difficult for people. So we try and bridge that gap and try and have some continuity so that you don't feel abandoned by the institution if you're coming to the end of your life. Who's on our palliative care team uh, at Sloan Kettering? There's the chief of service, Dr. Paul Glare, who will be speaking next. We have five attendings, and they have varied backgrounds, internal medicine, geriatrics, neurology. We have fellows in training, and again, they come from diverse backgrounds, uh, from pediatrics to geriatrics. Uh, we have five advanced practice nurses, and we have one social worker. And then we call on other services within the institution as they're needed uh, for a particular patient situation. For example, integrated medicine, chaplaincy, psychiatry, anesthesia pain for some of the interventional approaches, physical therapy, and nutrition. Those are just some examples. So the approach to care is very much a team approach and the members of the team who are most involved with the patient and family, it depends on the needs of the patient and family. How many patients do we see on our service? About, and this, these are from 2008 figures, about two, uh, 700 inpatient consults in a year. Uh, we have an inpatient pain and palliative care unit, um, and we have 90 patients in a year. Uh, outpatient visits, um, approximately uh, 1,600, and uh, uh, 338 are new visits, and uh, over 1,200 are follow-ups. So we continue to follow the patients over time when they're discharged from the hospital if they still have symptoms and distress that need management. Uh, and again, why we need an interdisciplinary team, um, and that's integral to palliative care, is because the symptoms are not only physical, but also associated with suffering. And some of the things, uh, particularly with advanced disease, uh, but throughout really sometimes a cancer um, uh, treatment, is that life is no longer as it was, and one's faced with one's own mortality with a, with a diagnosis of cancer. Um, uh, both the patient and the family can feel under threat because things are different now. Um, and this threat can be experienced on a psychological, social, emotional, and spiritual level, these aspects of a human being. And very much the meaning of the symptom affects the patient and family distress. So if someone was first diagnosed with, with cancer because they had pain, they went to their doctor and cancer was diagnosed, then frequently any little ache or pain, which may be totally unrelated to the cancer, brings back that fear and that concern. So the meaning of the symptom, again, we always ask because that can really impact on the suffering of the individual. Cecily Saunders, who was the um, founder of the modern hospice uh, movement in England, um, talked about total pain. And she talked about pain is more than the physical pain and related symptoms, but it's the impairment, the disability, the handicaps, the change of life with advanced cancer. So psychological distress with grief over loss and change, there can be very much social disruption with a lot of Im uh, financial impact um, uh, and role strains and different roles are taken on by different members of the family. And again, spiritual and existential distress. Why am I being punished? Why is this happening to me? I've always led a good life. I've got a family. How can this be happening to me? I have many responsibilities. All of these things you need to have an opportunity to talk about and to um, um, express. So this is a diagram of uh, this concept of total pain then not only the tissue damage response, but again, emotional, spiritual, financial, and, and physical. And that's why we have a multidisciplinary team approach. Again, the best way to manage these sort of symptoms or this construct in a human being of suffering, both physical symptoms and the psychosocial, emotional, and spiritual symptoms is why, through this multidisciplinary team. And if these symptoms and distress are tackled early on um, at the need when you're still, someone's still hoping for cure or certainly for life prolongation with cancer as a chronic disease, then um, hopefully uh, if uh, you're not going to be cured of your cancer and end of life is coming, then the symptoms will be better managed because they've been managed all the way through and you have a pathway of people who are helping you from the beginning and they'll carry it through to the very end. 
um, palliative care should be available in settings wherever people are, are, are being uh, looked after. So in the community, uh, acute care hospitals, long-term care facilities. And it's provided through a variety of models, a palliative care team, that's consultation team, um, which we have in our own center here. And then the hospice model of care, where palliative care is intensified at end of life. Palliative care, aggressive treatment of symptoms, addressing suffering, uh, emotional distress, spiritual distress, using a team approach, but at end of life, with a life expectancy of six months or less, the model that palliative care is intensified is a hospice model of care. Uh, a little bit about our hospice care and palliative care the same, and I sort of stress that the care is the same, but the model is different. That the modern hospice movement started in the United Kingdom in the mid-1960s, and that was to address the specific needs of dying patients. It was felt that dying patients were not well cared for, they tended to be ignored, and no one knew how to take care of them. And they didn't really give patients a chance to talk about what was happening and about the fact that they were dying and what it meant to them. So it, it, was, they weren't, it was sort of a, a closed topic. And as people started to talk about what it was like to come to the, towards the end of your life, it was enormous relief of this distress and burden. And they could suddenly start putting the end of their life into the whole construct of their whole life story and what their legacy, what they were leaving behind, the impact that had on the world. Really important. Um, and, but the, the model tended to be freestanding hospices to care for the dying. So it was a sort of a, a building. Um, as well as a philosophy of care. And then it came to the United States in the 1970s, and it became a Medicare a benefit for those with a prognosis of six months or less in the mid-1980s. In the United States, it's mostly home care with short periods of hospitalization. And this concept of, of hospice care has really been adopted throughout the world and is very much supported by the World Health Organization. So the palliative care model then evolved from that, the hospice model. So it was a hospice model first, and the palliative care model evolved from that because um, many people had a lot of symptoms, a lot of suffering with advanced debilitating disease, um, but they weren't eligible for hospice. So we, they needed the sort of care that was given, but they needed it to be uh, integrated into life-prolonging therapy. So because people were living longer with chronic debilitating disease, um, that was how the palliative care, the hospice model, stretched further back to be integrated in life-prolonging therapy because the need was also there because of symptoms and suffering. So palliative care really evolved from the, the hospice model of care. So hospice then is a model of care, a program where palliative care, expert management of symptoms and suffering is intensified as an individual moves closer to death. Um, things of importance uh, when patients are coming closer to death, and Carol Kruger will address this more thoroughly, uh, a life review, how you integrate this end of life into your whole life story, um, resolving conflicts and forgiveness, um, spending time with families and friends, saying your goodbyes, uh, giving to others things of wisdom, what am I leaving behind? Not not concrete, tangible things, but your life. Um, an affirmation of who you are as a whole person. Again, the similarities, addressing physical and non-physical symptoms, uh, a team approach with continuity of care, patient and family, the unit of care, 24-hour access to care, options and choices, informed decision-making, so you have to have information that you can understand the benefits and burdens of the next uh, treatment, so you decide whether this was, is what you want or if you don't want it. There's no one right way. It depends on your goals, your values, your beliefs. Um, and very much appreciation of the family story. We have to know who you are, the family narrative, before we can help you sort out what you want and what's best for you. So we need to know who you are as a person. Again, these are th um, the times which can be very difficult um, communication and choices in times of transition when going from diagnosis to treatment induction, um, treatment and side effects, uh, stopping treatment, recurrent disease or metastatic disease, uh, perhaps research protocols, and then um, when these are no longer a benefit to you or more of a burden, 
and coming to the end of her life, then terminal illness where hospice steps in. So um, these are times of transitions, all of these times, which um, can be difficult and uh, sometimes uh, help is, is, is useful. Advanced care planning uh, is incredibly important throughout the course of a, a disease like cancer, um, uh, which is a life-threatening illness um, for many. Um, so depending on uh, your goals and your van values, uh, it's really important that you have advanced directives so that people will know what you want and what's important to you uh, if you're no longer to make, able to make those decisions for yourself. How many of you have advanced directives in this room? Great, so a large number of you do, not everyone. So think of an advanced directive if you're extremely well and healthy and are not really thinking about end of life. It's very important because these things can happen very suddenly. So advanced directives, identifying someone who would make decisions for you, who knows your goals and your values, is really important. It just protects you. Um, particularly when there are changes in goals of care, um, it's very important to have family meetings. And we have family meetings so that everyone can sit around the table together. Uh, the patient, the important people in their lives, um, uh, uh, involved clinicians can all be around the table together. And often what will happen is the physician will go over uh, the, the, what's been happening in the disease process, treatment that's been had to date, uh, what the um, uh, options and goals are now, what's possible and what's not possible. And then the, um, the patient will really talk about what their goals are, what they want, what they hope for, uh, what their values are. And we try and put it all together, uh, what's possible, what's not, uh, what are the options, and then the decisions are made. But family meetings are incredibly useful, and we have them. That's an integral part, again, of palliative care, particularly when, there's, uh, when we first meet a patient and family, and also when there are transitions in goals of care, really important. Why these transitions and goals of care are so difficult? Um, most people prefer not to stare uh, death in the face, at least not their own. We tend not to think about it because we tend to keep on thinking about the future. And we have all of these goals and things we're going to do in the future. And if we then have a life diagnosed with a life-threatening disease, suddenly we stop, our, stop short and our life story changes. And we have to develop then a different life story. And the system of end-of-life care in this country works best for those who plan ahead for their terminal illness. And most of us find planning for our own death extremely hard to do. And the number of people who prepare advanced directives remains small. Uh, for example, like living wills, who sort of, which are more specific about what you want. But most important is that form the healthcare proxy, where you appoint an agent who knows your wishes. Um, this was a quote by uh, uh, Susan uh, Sontag in 1977, and I think it really does spell it out. Illness is the night side of life, a more onerous citizenship. Everyone who is born holds a dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and the sick. Although we all prefer to use only the good passport, sooner or later, each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as citizens of that other place. It is hardly possible to take up one's residence in the kingdom of the ill, unprejudiced by the lurid metaphors with which it has been landscaped. So many of us know people who have had difficult deaths, uncontrolled pain, and suffered a great deal. That shouldn't happen in this day and age with um, good palliative care support and good hospice support. So again, model of palliative care is a really important uh, model of care to integrate into comprehensive cancer care. Thank you. <laughs>